So, hello there, GeoConf. Um, thank you all for attending my talk, uh, Accessibility as a Game Design Pillar, or if it only has one button, how hard can it be? Uh, so, who am I? Uh, just to quickly run that down, uh, I'm Johnny Wallbank. I've been a games designer working in the industry for a little over 10 years now. Uh, I've worked as lead designer on five projects now at companies like Codemasters and Pixel Toys. Uh, I found myself wanting more creative freedom and design agency over time, including push pushing for better accessibility features in games uh, I was working on, and so I decided to go indie at the start of 2018. Uh, I also do a charity gaming marathon with a group of friends uh, over the Easter weekend for uh, special effects. Uh, I'm a special effects ambassador as well. Uh, that's where I was introduced to the fantastic work they do, and it really raised my awareness for how important accessibility is in games so that everyone can play on. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the uh, first indie game I've made called Bubbles the Cat um, <laughs> uh, in relation to its development and how I used uh, accessibility as a core pillar to develop the title. Uh, so here's some GIFs to show you the uh, game in progress. Um, all the different power-ups. I'll be going, breaking this down in a bit more detail as we go through and explaining how it all works. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the approach I used to guide my decision-making for this game. Uh, I'd very much designed this title as uh, being accessible from the very beginning. Uh, so as I said, I was inspired by the work of Special Effects and other um, high-quality games I'd seen at the time that were really pushing for better accessibility features. Uh, and I wanted as many people to be able to play my game as possible, young or old, platform fan or not, and designed so that people who may not be able to play um, traditional platformers would be able to enjoy bubbles, such as um, those with uh, challenges uh, with respect to most conditions. Um, I also wanted to prove that accessibility doesn't mean that a game can't have depth. I'm sure we're all familiar with various comments around the internet that say that, oh, you've included the, the accessibility features, just uh, take all the challenge out of a game, and I wanted to prove that's absolutely not the case. Um, so I'm going to run over what pillars are in game development. Um, these are some of the traditionally established very early on, and uh, sort of like high-level rules that determine the game's identity and guide all aspects of the game's production, uh, development. Sorry. So design, code, art, and production all need to make sure that these pillars are being met in all the work that's being produced. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples from some co fairly contemporary games. Um, Great Item Game is one from Diablo 3, uh, where a lot of emphasis was placed on making the loot feel really impactful. So uh, stats, set bonuses, skulls, pauldrons on fire, all that good stuff. Uh, another quick example, military authenticity from the older Call of Duty games. So uh, having weapons behave and feel like their historic counterparts in the same making sure that the battles are based around um, those that took place in World War II. So for this project, I thought I'd extend the principle to have accessibility pillars for my game. So these would be core tenets that wouldn't be the game I'd want to make if I broke them. And for me, in this game, this meant that I was going to have simple, ideally one-button controls to have as few barriers as possible for, players, um, for my players. Um, so the holy, holy grail for me would be if the game could be played with something like Eye Gaze, for instance. Uh, I wanted pick up and play gameplay, so a game that anyone, regardless of experience of platformers, could just immediately see, understand the game, and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I get how that works. Uh, and I wanted customizable assists so that players could just play the game however they want. Um, so let's tick off the first one of these pillars, um, and that's customizable assists. So at any time in the game, you can just pause it and turn on the ability to uh, toggle invincibility, or have infinite bubbles, or even skip the level. Um, the infinite bu the bubbles are effectively what controls your air jumps. These lasted the whole way through the game's various iter iterations and redesigns, but which we'll come onto shortly. Uh, so you may have noticed that I've sort of borrowed these from uh, Celeste, um, the game by Matt Makes Games. Uh, I think it's now called Extremely OK Games. Um, and it's, it's amazing. It's one of the best platforms ever made. Please play it. <laughs> um, I think what surprised me about this is that these also ended up being great for so many more different types of games than I expected. There are folks who prefer to play the game with a more analytical, puzzle-solving um, approach who were able to enjoy the game playing this. And also um, younger gamers, like my four-year-old nephew, who couldn't really enjoy traditional platformers, uh, but he had a lot of fun just making a cat with a silly hat and a rainbow trail jump around. So uh, that was hugely rewarding. Please put these in every game. 
So, um, my first attempt uh, to develop this game were, with, an accessible, with accessibility in mind was uh, a mouse control platformer. So it was kind of like a hybrid between Lemmings and an auto-running platformer. So the idea being that you'd click or tap on Bubbles, the cat, proper noun, to jump, or click outside of Bubbles to place Bubbles, the collective noun, in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't think that through when I was naming the game. <laughs> Um, so the idea effectively being you'd click on that part of the world to interact with it. So sounds good on paper, right? Um, let's have a look at how the game looked back in the earlier prototypes. Um, uh, yeah, the graphics are a little rough. It's a combination of open source artwork and uh, my own handiwork. I am not good at art. Um, so you can sort of see like, how I was trying to get depth from the game here by having all these different bubble power-ups that you could uh, place within the environment, like there, to blow up a wall, and then it makes your jumps really powerful. And also in the next slide here, you can see um, the bubbles being used to absorb all the fireballs, uh, and that was a really cool uh, environmental uh, feature, standout feature for the game. So just to do uh, quick pros and cons of this, uh, of this iteration, um, yep, it's a unique platformer, so it stands out, quite important in the marketplace these days. Uh, interactive environment's really cool, and it's a single button platformer. So, all good, right? No. <laughs> it is actually not that great to play. Um, it's a nightmare to place bubbles within the world. Um, you've got a moving camera, uh, and you're trying to place, make pinpoint accuracy with a moving camera. It just, it's, it's not a good time. Uh, and quite often the game would mis uh, misinterpret uh, what you're trying to do in this image, you can see um, I'm clicking on a bubble at the same time I want to jump over the spikes, and yeah, no. <laughs> um, another big con is that you can't play with a controller with this design, uh, and obviously that's hugely important for supporting things like uh, bespoke controller setups, such as the adapt Xbox adapter controller. So uh, let's quickly review the accessibility pillars. Um, <laughs> simple controls? Nope. <laughs> You require way too much accuracy. Um, it's, it's not even remotely accessible. Pick up and play gameplay, not really. Um, people were struggling to understand um, what would happen if they clicked on different parts of the screen. They didn't understand how to make bubbles the cat jump. They didn't know how to interact with the environment. It's, it's not really going anywhere. But on the upside, customizable assist. So one out of three ain't bad. Um, my first attempt to fix this was to improve the hitboxes around all the player and interactable objects. So these would be the invisible zones um, that we would detect you making clicks or taps with them. So uh, clicking near the player instead snapped a bubble directly under them to make, the, make it much easier to set up junk parks. And similarly, if you clicked on fireballs, it would scoop them up with, uh, without the need to be quite so accurate. Now, how do we think this did? Spoiler alert. It's not so good. Um, it still requires way too much uh, precision inputs. Um, so I've effectively made no further progress on the pillars with, the, with this iteration. But I did start getting the feedback. Why don't you just make it so you can just tap under, uh, tap so that it places bubbles uh, anywhere? And I was kind of, that would have meant that I'd lost, lose the interaction with the world. But um, I thought it was the right decision to uh, make for, in, in terms of making an accessible platformer. So clicking, tapping, or pressing an action button places a bubble, collective noun, anywhere. Um, and it means that controller supports are now possible. So that's really, really opened up my accessibility options. Uh, to quickly overview the gameplay, if you bounce off bubbles now, you trigger their special ability. So uh, in this image, you can see bubbles bouncing around near all these weak walls uh, and causing them to explode. Um, and this is making really, really good progress in, in terms of my accessibility pillars. So, We've now got a uh, mostly one-button game, with one exception that I'll come, uh, come on to shortly. Uh, the game's way, way easier to pick up. Uh, when I took the game to shows, the general instruction I gave was, you just need the A button, off you go. And most players were able to intuit what was required pretty quickly. And of course, customizable assists. But I did lose some uh, gameplay with this new system, such as being able to absorb fireballs. and. With a controller in the mix, how was I going to do that? Would I have to assign a separate button? That's not a two-button game anymore. So how do we fix this? Uh, well, the answer is to lean into, the, um, lean into this design and um, uh, embrace it further. So here's the wall of power-up. Uh, uh, whenever you bounce off this bubble, it blocks fireballs, effectively recreating the functionality that I'd lost. 
Uh, it also allows you to turn around on commands, and it creates cool vertical gameplay options. So my accessibility pillars are giving rise to cool new game design options. Uh, it also meant that I was able to include new bubble types that wouldn't have worked at all with the previous, um, with the previous iteration. So this, uh, this is the bob up bubble, uh, and you just tap to bob upwards. Might remind you of a certain game uh, involving birds that flap. <laughs> and it, but it really took advantage of the single button controls. So coming back to that, uh, the accessibility pillars earlier, there was a question mark around one of them. Uh, so this is the launch bubble in the prototype. Uh, in this iteration, uh, you collect the power up, uh, you jump into a bubble, and after a few seconds, it would follow the uh, set bubbles, fly, bubbles the cat proper noun, flying in the direction indicated by the arrow. Uh, one thing you can't capture here is that it's kind of a nightmare to control on touchscreen devices because you're not even getting this feedback of where the mouse cursor is. So my first attempt to fix this was to try and make it controllable with the analog stick and lock it to eight directions. So um, I think you can immediately see the problem here. It's not improved the accuracy anymore on touchscreen devices. You're not getting that feedback. But crucially, it's not a one-button game. So this isn't really an appropriate solution. Uh, my next attempt to fix this was to have it auto-rotate clockwise through uh, each of the eight directions every quarter of a second or so. It is very easy to miss your cue here, as, as you might be able to see from the uh, GIF here. Um, and when you do, it's a really frustrating wait for it to get back to the same point. No, this isn't, this isn't really pick up and play. It's kind of a nightmare to interact with. So my third attempt was to massively slow down the direction change, lock it to uh, the three directions, so forward, diagonal forwards, and upwards. Uh, and yeah, this, this, this did the trick. Uh, the feedback I was getting uh, was that this is far easier to control. And I'd kind of already designed the levels around this, so works out fine. Uh, there's quite a lot of interactions you can get out of just one button. Um, I thought I'd try and make a list of the, uh, all, the one, all the stuff you could do with just the bubble power-ups alone, and there's over 40 on here. Uh, so to have a look at what went well, uh, the game's good. It got re good reviews on iOS and Steam. Uh, players didn't seem to feel frustrated at a lack of control. Um, a, lot of speed, uh, a couple of like, hardcore speedrunners played the game and they're pleasantly surprised at what you were able to do. Uh, and the accessibility was uh, a big success. Um, I've got, I met uh, with Harry Nelson, um, one of the R&D wizards at um, Special Effects, who came up to me at Insomnia 65 and said that the game had made a huge difference for um, someone who was suffering from cerebral palsy and wasn't able to play Mario, but was able to play Bubbles. So that was, um, excuse me, that was um, immensely uh, rewarding. <laughs> Uh, just quickly, um, there were weaknesses with visual accessibility, as you, can, as you might be able to see here. There's a pink laser chasing um, Bubbles, the cat proper noun, against a sort of reddish background. Uh, and there's a lot of background detail as well, which could prove distracting. So I included options to fix that. Uh, something I might do for the next game is to have a visual accessibility uh, pillar so that I deal with this up front. Um, I also, the, the, the boosts that I have in the game are kind of a bit all or nothing. Um, it would have been nice to have a slow time as a medium option. Um, I think the biggest problem is the game's too difficult and frustrating. Um, there's a bit of a difficulty spike after World 3. It becomes very punishing. There's also, there's no checkpoints in the game. The idea being that the levels would be quite short because it also uh, was designed for mobile devices in mind. But maybe I could have done more with making the levels a little shorter. So quick run down the takeaways. Determine what your accessibility goals are from the game's inception. As stated earlier, the earlier you identify these things, the easier it is to implement. Uh, keep these in mind as you keep prototyping and developing the game. And please put assists in your game. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. If you want to come and grab me, I'm on Team Cats and Bears on Twitter. Uh, and just come and say hello after the talk. Thank you. <laughs>